So the, we, we were able to look at tonight uh, the first minute or two of a documentary that we're working on about the gay rights movement in Cuba. And uh, it, it tells the story of the extraordinary homophobia that came with the revolution. At the begin, beginning of the revolution, Fidel and Raul and um, the leaders of the revolution rounded up and locked up all the homosexual men that they could identify and put them in camps for two years. Um, if you were identified as gay, possibly gay, lesbian, transgender, uh, you would be kicked out of whatever educational institution you were in. You couldn't teach. You would be thrown out of your jobs. It was a really homophobic revolution. And around five years ago, Raul's daughter and Fidel's niece, Mariela Castro, uh, felt that this was wrong and that she was going to do something about it. So she's the leader of the LGBT revolution in Cuba. It's a delicious irony, but it's also very effective because she's the president's daughter and <laughs> Cuba has moved uh, very, very rapidly. It's a conservative, Catholic, uh, macho culture. And uh, some part they've been drag kicking and streaming, screaming, some part she's pushing them. And so this is the story of uh, the fight for equal rights in Cuba. And so how much time have you invested in completing the film since then? Uh, not enough to do it in the verite style that I'd like to. So um, everybody talks about how wonderful it is to be free and independent uh, as a filmmaker. But it's also a disaster financially unless you have a trust fund. Anybody here have a trust fund? Because there are a couple of documentary makers with trust funds, and they get to make lots of documentaries. Um, for this, uh, we vacuumed all the nickels and dimes out of the couch and looked under the rug and ran the credit cards up. It's all the stuff that independent filmmakers do that I don't like to do uh, and have been working primarily with HBO for the past 20 years so that I don't have to do. But uh, this film didn't have any sponsors, and so we self-financed it. So we went for one week, came back and edited, went for another week, came back and edited, and I just was there a month ago for the final week. And um, so what would you estimate was the, the budget for the film? Uh, $100,000 so far, and we're not at the finish line. Um, the film ends with Mariela Castro singing John Lennon's song, all you need is love. Mm -hmm. How much do you think that's going to cost us? A lot. <laughs> and so we don't know what to do because it's a really good scene. And, and she not only sings it to us and explains that that's her philosophy, um, that we all need to love each other, just simple like that. And then she leads a parade down the street of the Cuban equivalent of Boise, Idaho. Um, with a rainbow flag and everybody singing all you need is love in Spanish. I can assert fair use for a lot of that, but um, it's, it, it, the music's not strong enough, and so we need to augment it with the real Beatles song for it to have the full effect and power, and I have no idea how to deal with that, because uh, didn't Michael Jackson buy the, the, all the Beatles music? I think he did, right? I think Paul McCartney bought it back. Paul McCartney bought it back. Well, here's an office up on 55th Street. We can go around you know after him? the conversation. <laughs> okay. No, I know he's architect, if that helps. That helps. Because tell him, tell him that, that we're going to make all his doors work backwards uh, unless he gives us that. Because that, I mean, seriously, that could cost $100,000. It could cost more than in the, in the entire budget for the documentary. So this work of passion, mm -hmm. you've created the film out of, out of loyalty to a senior filmmaker who you greatly respect, mm -hmm. but also there must be some special background in Cuba that you have that, in, that pushed you into this process or drew you in. Well, I've been going to Cuba for the past, uh, since 1972. Mm -hmm. We want... Uh, on a boat and got boat arrested when we landed in Havana. Uh, we made the first uh, documentary that was on American TV about Cuba in many, many years in 1974. Um, I went back, I've probably been to Cuba 50 times, uh, spent a lot of time with Fidel, uh, with some uh, really quite unusual footage with Fidel. Uh, and then my passion project in Cuba is I've been following three families since 1974. Uh, and it's a real roller coaster uh, as you see what's happened to them and 
in any relationship, whether it's a personal relationship, governmental relationship, corporate relationship, um, ossification sets in, uh, you wake up in the morning and uh, they're not quite as pretty as they were when you first met them, um, your expectations don't get realized, uh, and so to watch the Cuban Revolution mature over the years and to some degree stagnate um, is really fascinating. So you're, you're the same age as me. You would have been, as a young man, faced the but draft. You look, you look younger. Thank you. I think we're, we're both doing well, both have active lives. But you would have faced the draft or the, the Vietnam uh, era. So many of us who, fa and I'm an Australian, but we also had the draft and we also had troops in Vietnam. But it was a defining experience for me. Yep. And, but you, unlike most of our generation, have really kept the faith, it seems. You've maintained your commitment to documentaries that are dedicated in some way to social change and understanding society. Is that a fair description? Well, I would say so because I certainly didn't approach this because I wanted to be a filmmaker. Um, I, I didn't want to be a filmmaker. I didn't want to be an artist. Uh, we were all working. Uh, for some aspect of societal change or, or community change. So you are an old lefty? Well, you see... Well, you're lefty. Well, um, the labels like that have gotten me in so much trouble um, <laughs> because um, I've been blacklisted from public television, uh, which is no fun at all. I've been blacklisted from commercial television, which is no fun at all. Uh, so I'm always trying to hide um, my personal uh, beliefs. I don't succeed. But uh, we, we, we approached this in the beginning because we were such failures as community organizers and union organizers. I was driving a taxi cab. My garage actually, the 60s, my garage is over on 60th and 11th. Uh, there's a giant skyscraper there now. But that used to be the Irishman's garage. And um, gosh, they were cheating us, uh, the union was corrupt, um, they were stealing our money, and we were trying to organize the taxi drivers, and it wasn't working. Um, worse than herding cats. Mm -hmm. uh, but one day, I made a videotape about all the things that we should be fighting for, and it was like magic. And everybody uh, got invigorated, and uh, it, it worked. So as this is when you were in your 20s. So this was in my 20s, and we did the same thing down in Chinatown with uh, the issues that were affecting us, the schools, health care, mm -hmm. employment, made films about these issues, and they also were very, very important in bringing about change. And so that's where I come from. Um, and that's why we started our center down in Chinatown. I know uh, I see a lot of people here who have been down to DC TV. Um, and we're still doing what we were doing in those days, classes, equipment for filmmakers. And being an independent filmmaker uh, can have very unpleasant moments. I mean, I uh, have had my teeth kicked in uh, by so many people. And when I'm like looking on the floor to find out where they are, but then I look up and I see all our high school students over in the corner making films about their lives and they're really powerful films and um, it, it, it's okay. So the center is still a very active yeah, very part so. of your life. Mm -hmm. it's the, the, it is the center of your, remains the center of your professional life. Right? Over, my, over my heart all the time. I would have I worn, worn the t-shirt too. So uh, in, this, in the 70s you, you were a pioneer of a video active activism, mm -hmm. and you actually succeeded in, like so few of us, in establishing a, a really a really viable centre. How did you move from there into actually creating documentary films? What was the transition? Um, uh, part of it was luck. Part of it was going places where other people wouldn't go or were afraid to go or couldn't get in, and and being so stupid. Um, that, um, well, this seems like a really great place to go up to the battlefield where the Vietnamese, Vietnamese and the Chinese are, are trying to kill each other. Uh, and and um, it was like such stupid ignorance that allowed us to blissfully walk into these places that smarter people wouldn't go. Um, so you were an, an adrenaline junkie for a while? A, a no, I was a moron. Just but, stupid. Uh, but, but the other thing is that uh, um, 
we, we really were pioneers in the use of this electronic equipment. And the uh, established filmmakers all thought that video was basically just children's toys right. and um, ignored or spit on us for the first 10 years. And the same thing with the networks. Um, and so even though we didn't have any talent or aptitude or experience or real learning, um, we had such a head start on everybody because by the time they, oh, well, maybe this is a, a, a very useful medium, we had already figured out how to use it and we're three or four laps around the track. Mm -hmm. So, so did, did you work in video? When, when yes, did you, I when did, did in start? Australia. When in did the, you start? In the 70s, in 1973, I started a, a got a small, a small grant from the new Labor government in Australia to start a video centre in a, a technical high school. And um, it was the start of my, my and, career. And did that work too. well? Yeah, it, it worked well until, yeah, it worked well and it succeeded for many years until the state government there in its wisdom consolidated technical high schools with high schools and uh -huh. took away the practical elements of, of uh, young people's education in working class neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. in, in 1978, we had a fiscal crisis here in New York City. I remember um, where the president told the city to drop dead, mm -hmm. uh, and they brought in an economic czar, this guy uh, Berger, I think his name was. And they put him in a superior position to all the contracts that the city had. Uh, he had uh, basically total control over the city's budget. Uh, and they eliminated all the electives in high schools, especially high schools for poor kids. And so all the gym uh, classes disappeared, the teams disappeared, band disappeared, uh, the arts programs disappeared. And it was all the stuff that I liked. The only reason why I went to high school were for those things. I didn't go for the math class. Yeah, me too. Uh, and, and it just seemed to be grossly unfair that what was such a big part of what I thought was the American experience was being denied to hundreds of thousands of kids in New York City. So that's when we started our teaching program. Huh. And um, we did some teaching in the schools, but it, it became easier uh, in order to sort of avoid the, the sort of pitfalls of the budgets and consolidations and bureaucracies to have it at our center. Mm -hmm. So the kids come in the afternoon. And it gives them such confidence to be able to technically master the, just the process of conceiving and executing mm -hmm. A project. So let's get back to this pro this transition from uh, community and community educational video to creating documentaries. Mm -hmm. uh, the last time you responded to my question, I think we were up on the Chinese Vietnamese border. What ex what was? Well, I'd already been blacklisted by by by, by public television at that particular point. Um, our start um, as. A, as documentary filmmakers, and the first time we ever made anything that was longer than 20 minutes, was uh, we went to Cuba in 1974. Mm -hmm. And we came back with 40 hours worth of footage. We were using the first color porta pack that anybody had used before. It was made by JVC. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a, a miracle and a disaster all rolled into one. Miracle because it was this big and shot in color. And PBS and all the stations had been uh, using the fact that we were all working in black and white as a barrier and to sort of keep us out. They didn't want to say, well, we don't want your film. They just said, we can't use your film because it's not in color. And so JVC invented this. We had machine serial number two that had literally come off the assembly line, had never been tested, and had so many things wrong with it that um, our inexperience and the limitations of, of this uh, contraption there was just a lot of junk footage, uh, both because we didn't know how to shoot, we didn't know how to construct it, we didn't know what a cutaway was, all, the, all these different things. But we came back, no from PBS, no from ABC, no from CBS. Uh, NBC at least invited us over because they wanted to show their engineers hmm. this equipment. And he said, listen, John, we don't take anything from independents, but I just want to show this to my engineers. And so they bring in the engineers and they play a sample clip. And the engineers were astonished. How did you get those big quad machines? In those days, the, the machines that were good enough for the networks were the size of grand pianos. And they wanted to know how we got these grand pianos down to Cuba. And, and then they thought it was stop, shot in 35 millimeter and 16 millimeter. And so then the vice president says, no, this was shot on a $2,000 
JVC Porter Pack, and they say, oh, yeah, yeah, look at the misregistration and the ringing over here, and, and oh, we, it, it, we would never broadcast this. He thanks them, they go out of the room, and he turns to me and he goes, boy, they're full of shit. <laughs> and, and he says, watch this, and he picks up the phone and he calls Sony and orders 100 machines. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was the beginning of the ENG revolution at the networks. Right. Um, and they had something uh, called the TV Lab at Channel 13. Anybody familiar with that? Yeah, I remember that. Okay, so the TV Lab was an experimental division of Channel 13. In those days, um, Channel 13 was on the cutting edge. Can you imagine a, a public television being on the cutting edge? And they were in the lead for everything, content, technical stuff, and they had this mad scientist of an engineer who could figure out how to make our stuff meet broadcast standards. Um, and so they wrestled with our first show. It's very, very primitive, and that was our first show that was on PBS, 1974. And that was Cuba. Life in Cuba. Life in Cuba. Uh -huh. And how was that budgeted? How did you fund we, it? We paid for it ourselves. I mean, that, who, you, who here has made films that they paid for completely by themselves? And so... But um, you got in the door. We got in the door, uh, took us... Uh, three years of lobbying, so figure out the economics, uh, two months down there shooting, uh, three months editing, um, and we got $12,000 uh, from, from Channel 13. Um, the next film we did was a film about Chinatown, got $12,000. Uh, so we weren't really good in the economics department. So that's, that's still about the standard rate for a uh, WNET license fee for the region. Is it? So not much has changed. Yeah. So after Chinatown, when did you first step outside the United States? Uh, we were the first uh, TV crew to go to Vietnam um, after the war. So you went? 77. As, you went as a reporting crew? or As to a make reporting it? crew, and this was a, um, David Loxon ran the the TV lab tricked the Rockefeller Foundation. Mm -hmm. They only wanted to fund video art. They didn't want to fund anything that had a political uh, aspect to it. And he didn't tell them. And uh, just sent us. And uh, came back, oh, was that a controversial show? And was a, an, it was an hour-long documentary on life in Vietnam. After the war. Uh, after the victory slash defeat, mm -hmm. however, however you define it. Yeah. And how controversial was it? How did, how did that manifest itself? Well, I mean, even uh, this is, what, the 40th anniversary, and uh, there are, people are still wringing hands and reinterpreting and pointing fingers and, and stuff like that. So this was the first look at Vietnam after the war, and everybody was watching the show. And again, it was a time when PBS was a leader, and they would be the first uh, network to have a show about something. Um, so after, after Vietnam, you were, you were really engaged as, was that a work-for-hire project? Or did you take the risk of producing no, the no, program and selling it to the network, to P PBS? No, we, we knew when we went out the door that this was going to be on Channel 13 and the PBS system. Right. And, and they were behind us. So at what point did you break out? So it's, it's really a cottage industry at this, still at this stage. Very small fees, a lot of individual craftsmanship and risk. Mm -hmm. Is there a point where you broke through that to get a... a you know, let's call it a decent professional production budget. Hmm, not really. <laughs> uh, and, and uh, you know, when you're young, you can live cheap. Um, in those days in New York City, um, our loft cost us 50 bucks a month. Mm -hmm. um, geez, you're recording this. Uh, we, 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 um, we jimmied the electric meter mm -hmm. so we didn't have to pay for electricity. Um, I know five or six different ways to do that. We were all very, very well equipped in urban, urban survival. We knew as much about how to live for nothing. Uh, we knew more about that than we knew about making films. Mm -hmm. um, so I had, a, I had two years of that, and then I went to business school um, <laughs> in uh, New York. But um, but there must there, I looked at your resume. You've made what, tw there are twenty three incredibly important credits there. There's a point at which you're being engaged by HBO and other broadcasters to make so we important got, films. So we got blacklisted by PBS because of our healthcare documentary. We did a documentary in which we followed uh, the unfortunate patients who went to Kings County Hospital in Brooklyn, biggest hospital in the country, 
also in the middle of these budget cuts where they're just slashing every single day the services that they had at this hospital. And, and the people died on camera. Um, and it was shocking to us. I'd never seen anybody die before. And to film somebody who should be alive, but because of the budget shortages and the lack of personnel and the lack of equipment in the hospital dies, um, this didn't go over well with uh, the pharmaceutical companies. Um, five of them were the top 10 corporate contributors to Channel 13. And they had us walk the plank. And so that was a, 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 another PBS project. It was another PBS project, and, and uh, that was basically the end of our PBS career. Uh -huh. um, luckily for us, um, George Page, anybody watch the Nature Program, yeah. in which George Page, with his beautiful voice, talks about the lions and the eagles and things like that. Fabulous voice. George Page used to be NBC's hero correspondent. He was he had the pl the prime um, uh, assignment uh, for uh, NBC. He was the Vietnam correspondent during the Vietnam War, and um, he had a lot of sympathy for us because he knew what it was like to be blacklisted. But he also had connections at NBC, people who still respected him and liked him. And he sent us over to NBC when we were blacklisted. And we had the only visas in the United States to go to Vietnam to film the Vietnam-China border war. And we had never been to a war before. We had never been network correspondents before. I, I mean, I can tell you hours and hours of all the really stupid, dumb things that I did, uh, just imitating correspondence because I thought that's what you did. And I have the footage. It's really embarrassing. I actually I have a lecture in which I show these clips and embarrass myself. But we were the only people that were uh, covering this war. We got into Cambodia before anybody else got into Cambodia. Uh, we found and repatriated the last known American POW, Bobby Garwood. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say that nine-tenths of the people at, at NBC hated us because of who we were, where we were coming from, uh, out of corporate jealousy. If you've worked in the networks, uh, they're just viper pits. Uh, you know, such is the struggle of networks, either if you're working for a channel, and I think this applies for, to I any channel. Um, it's, a, it's an extremely competitive environment, and it's particularly competitive right now because the channels are losing audience to SVOD, to Netflix, and the other, other platforms, and you they're bet. using the youth audience. So the executives are, are, are paralyzed. They can either uh, commit to radical change and definitely get fired if they fail, or they can do the same old and probably not get fired. So they're in this real cycle of, of, of fear, many, many, many of the, or most, I'd say most of the channels right now. But let's go back, you know, you started working with HBO, mm -hmm. and they were the glory days of HBO. Everybody wanted to work for HBO documentaries. Could've and been, to actually have, to be well received in there was the, the peak of your profession. So. Uh, or our profession. How did you get in the door? Um, I got blacklisted at uh, uh, NBC because of my coverage of the first Gulf War. And so we went over to Baghdad when nobody else was in Baghdad except uh, your almost fellow countryman, Peter Arnett. And he got blacklisted too. Yeah, but later on. He, right. he, he, he ran for another 10 years. Um, and uh, he was last working for Chinese television, which I thought was pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and um, didn't, didn't, didn't really know what to do. And we had been um, following these three criminals from Newark, New Jersey. Um, my motorcycle had been stolen. Uh, my friend's house had been broken into. And we wanted to find out who these people were, why they were doing it. And so we basically embedded ourselves with three criminals. Uh, it's not the cops. It's the antithesis of cops. Uh, these are the guys that do the, the crimes. Um, and uh, Dalton Delan, who uh, is now a PBS executive in Washington, was Sheila's only assistant in those days at HBO. Uh, and uh, kept on, Sheila and Evans is the the queen of documentaries, uh, probably in, in, in the world, but certainly at HBO. So back to Dalton, you knew So Dalton, Dalton kept on bringing her a rough cut of, of this program with the criminals, and Sheila kept on rejecting it. And uh, uh, 
Dalton was persistent, and the fourth or fifth time, um, all of a sudden, she thought we were geniuses. I don't, who knows what changed? I, I have no idea. Well, Dalton, you might know, won the F. Scott Fitzgerald Writing Prize at Princeton, so everybody takes him very okay. seriously. Yeah. He knows talent. Better Is educated, it? smarter, okay. So, so HBO accept your first project. And, and that was a hit, and so um, in, in those days, if you had a hit documentary on HBO, your audience was, was millions of people, mm -hmm. three million people, four million people. Um, and uh, the audience has really shrunk. Uh, and so if you get a fraction of that now, um, you're considered having a big hit. And so the, it, it, there's so many different outlets that's chopped up the audience in so many pe pieces. Yeah, but still, it's you know, it's it's the flagship. It's the tent pole mm -hmm. of the entire industry, the to entire cable and satellite industry. Yet, so that was <coughs> your first project at HBO. Mm -hmm. Do you pitch? Did you go on then to pitch HBO, or do they tell you which programs they want you to make? What's the no? We were we we were we were uh, pitching HBO, and um, in general, most of the projects that we worked on for the next 15 years were our ideas. Uh -huh. um, but that's been changing more and more, and um, although they'll listen to our ideas, um, quite often it's uh, Sheila's ideas that wind up getting made. And is that a work for hire, or do you own residual rights in the project? Um, it's changed over time. So in the beginning, um, HBO would um, buy limited cable rights uh, and for a, um, a limited period of time, three years or something like that, and then they'd be back relicensing the the film and paying you extra money for it. So um, it actually was um, economically advantageous and better 25 years ago. Right. So um, did you have an international distributor back then? I wasn't smart enough. No, I didn't. I never. I, I we were always so busy like running on to the next film that we never properly marketed any of these internationally. But you must have accumulated a lot of rights over time. That, did, that, that we did nothing with, basically. That, you did that, nothing you know, with. It's, a, it's a, a pretty significant failure on our part. Because if you were British, you would have sold the company for three or four hundred million dollars or some, well, 30 or 40 million pounds or some big number like that. Wow. But, um, and then I'd have to move someplace, right? Because then you, once you have money like that, you can't live there, right? Yeah, you'd have to move to, back, to, back to Cuba to be able okay. to, 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 to live well. So, so, so but what's, what's happened is HBO has been um, uh, uh, aggressive now in acquiring all the rights in perpetuity. And so uh, when we make the film, um, it's great that we have all the resources that we need to make it. Um, if HBO likes the film, when they put their shoulder behind it, there's no nicer feeling than watching them push your film up the hill. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of remuneration or anything else like that, it's their film. Right. And how many films have you made for HBO then? A lot. I can't count them. Is there a standout? One that you are more proud of than any? Well, the Life of Crime 2 I like a lot. Uh, it was better than Life of Crime 1, because Life of Crime 1, um, I had no idea what I was doing. We were with these criminals, they were robbing stores, they are committing all sorts of crimes, and we were in a very uncomfortable ethical position, mm -hmm. and also in a technical uh, position. Uh, we needed hidden cameras to film. Sounds like the wire, scenes. but real. Um, it was real, and, and I spend more time with these criminals than I do with my family. I, as a filmmaker, you're always at somebody else's birthday and somebody else's Christmas. All the iconic moments are moments that you spend with the people in your film and not with your friends or your family. Um, so I spend a lot of time in Newark. Uh, and actually, I can't get a speeding ticket in Newark. They, all the cops still know me. I can go through Newark at 90 miles an hour. <laughs> And, and uh, they, they, they all just wave at me. They all know who I am. So, but why is the film a standout? Is it there's something, some artistic quality of it that, uh, that really presses your buttons? Um, I think that um, we did a really good job of capturing uh, who these people were and showing things that um, you would not think that they would ever let anybody record. If I was them, I wouldn't let me record it. Um, so um, I think the film's good for, for, for that reason. For and unique access. Unique access, and it, it, you understand people who have um, either gotten trapped or made choices to get themselves trapped. Um, and you can really see the destructive 
uh, path that drugs has burned through our country. Uh, we have a number of films that sort of illustrate that. The film we made up in Lowell, uh, mm -hmm. High on Crack Street, is similarly themed. In terms of fun, uh, the year we got to spend following Pat Summit and the University of Tennessee women's basketball team. Uh, wow, that was great. Uh, and, and it had an ending that was completely unexpected. HBO tried to pull the plug on that documentary halfway through because they thought I had chosen the wrong team to follow. Huh. Why? Because they were losing every game. <laughs> <laughs> and then they started winning? You know, they got beat by Old Dominion. Um, and the, the, the team was weeping in the locker room. Um, I, when, when you're a sportsman in Australia, they probably teach you, you, you know, you're tough, you, you get knocked down, suck it up. Um, I never seen sports people cry. And they're weeping in the locker room, uh, so devastated by this loss. And the coach comes in and she, she demands that everybody give her their attention. And she tells them that this is the first time she enjoyed coaching them the whole year because they fought and they hadn't fought. And she said, if you fight like this every game, I guarantee you will be fighting for the championship in March. And the little hairs in the back of my neck went up. I believed it. And uh, she could have gotten them, and she did eventually get them to walk through walls. Um, and they beat Evil Connecticut in a game that nobody thought they would win because she stayed up uh, three nights without sleeping and watched tape for three nights until she discovered the weakness uh, that, that Connecticut had and uh, beat them. And HBO had, had um, demanded that I stop filming, uh, was going to stop um, the, the program basically in midstream, and I told them if they did that, I'd just finish it myself, and that, um, that they better give me their home phone number because when um, Tennessee won the championship, I was going to call them up and go, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> so, so before we break for questions, when, you, when you're considering a project that you take, take on, do you have a formula? You know, like the, the classic three boxes to tick. Great characters, unique access, and jeopardy or risk. Do you look for qualities like that in every story? Do you have a formula? Um, we have a formula that, we, uh, that, that I believe um, will sort of lead you towards success um, if you're able to have these uh, three ingredients. And so one is time. So you need to be able to spend enough time on the project with your subjects um, so that you get to see things as they really happen, so that um, uh, people welcome you into their lives. Um, so time gives you access. You have to have some type of access that's better. The access that I have um, needs to be better than your access. And, and the audience needs to feel that they're being taken to someplace special. Uh, so the Cuba Project has access to Mariela Castro. Right. And that was the first thing that, that made me um, think, wow, this could be a really interesting project. And the last thing has to be passion, because you're going to wind up going to unpleasant places. You're going to wind up not having enough money. You're going to wind up uh, working on this for an extremely long period of time. And you have to believe that it's very important for you to make this film, that you're the person that should be making the film and that the film is going to accomplish something that's important. So um, I've spent mm -hmm, sort of like one year's uh, college tuition for somebody of my own personal money working on this film uh, because I believe it's an important message that there shouldn't be any form of discrimination and that uh, I want to challenge people who do discriminate to watch this film and I hope that they're thinking changes. Um, I'm very interested in my mother. My mother um, is the basically primary target of this film. Hmm. Um, and the whole film is being shaped. She uh, didn't blacklist you too? Oh, my, my mom's been pretty tough on me during, during uh, certain uh, periods. You know, certainly it's really tough on the families when you're going to dangerous places and you have to train your family. How long did it take you to train your family? Uh, I just didn't tell them what I was doing. Uh -huh, okay. And that's an important aspect. You, I mean, you have to have some type of strategy uh, for, for dealing with people who aren't involved in this insane world that we're involved in. Right, so, John, it's a fascinating career, a very admirable one, full of really great works, and um, particularly wonderful for me since we both started our lives out with porta packs. 
It's a long time since I heard that word. We all have one shoulder that's lower than the other because uh -huh. that's how we carried it. I actually did a program in Australia with kids with porta packs in which we simulated a kidnap and I was with a ransom note and so on. Uh -huh. And I was also an English teacher and these kids were basically Maltese or Greek sons of migrants so mm -hmm. they had impoverished English. Uh -huh. And the best way to motivate them was to put them into some dramatic situation where they'd be writing scripts and writing, no, writing um, ransom notes and so on. Anyway, some TV reporter heard about this, wrote it up, and the next thing I was the um, a scapegoat for everything that was going wrong in education, teaching kids how to kidnap instructions, and, and um, it was a it was a it was a, it was a tough moment. So, and I was on a minor blacklist there too. Anyway, question time. Please identify yourself by your name and where you're from and ask your question quickly and clearly. Thank, Thank you very much. much. You know, we we have, Peter, I'm gonna, before we go to the audience, yeah. I'm gonna take uh, executive director's privilege here. Please. Um, before we throw it at the audience. Because we're, there are a lot of young, inspiring filmmakers here. That's certainly part of it, but maybe you can address how the environment specifically has changed. And Peter, I know you know quite a lot about this as well. And where the real opportunities lie to to get these films made and to get them seen. If, if, if you're somebody, somebody now who's an undergrad, a graduate student, or you're out there trying to scrape some, some money together to make a film. Please. I don't I think, think the environment's changed. changed. I think that it's a, it's a tough uh, slog for anybody. Um, I think that um, it's um, important that when you're young and your costs of living are um, a little bit lower, you don't have as many people who depend on you, you don't have kids, um, it's your opportunity to be able to exploit yourself. Uh, and um, the thing that has changed is that the equipment's cheaper, the equipment's better, uh, you can control the means of production yourself. In the old days, nobody could edit by themselves. Um, your iPhone um, is a better technological tool than the cameras that we had for the first 10 years of video. Um, so that part really has changed. And so you can go out and make the project that you think the world uh, needs to see, but you aren't in any better position than we were. Um, you have more outlets, but they're outlets that don't pay. Uh, and so that's the difficulty, is that a lot of the people who would love to have your material for uh, online release are gonna offer you pennies on the dollar. Uh, the important thing is that you do need to look around and see who's growing, because every once in a while, one of the mushrooms pops up. Yeah. And so Vice has popped up. And so has anybody been out to the Vice uh, headquarters in Brooklyn? So there are, um, opportunities and every once in a while somebody invests in Yahoo or invests in one of the other websites and they're hungry for a while and you just have to know where that is right. um, and go over and invite yourself for for lunch lightning lightning can strike so um, I, we got another question and then I have a final question too I think we're getting close to the end we got one over here hi my name is Erica um, it seems that there is a proliferation of documentary filmmakers, of storytellers um, that has risen along with the access to equipment. And there's also all these outlets for distribution. That makes the field much more competitive than ever before, I feel. And I think the only way to really stand out is to tell unique and compelling stories, which that's something that has really set you apart in your career. So if you could share some advice in terms of how to get access to those unique stories because um, the access is very key. How is it that you find these people and also there's, you definitely have a way in which you, um, people trust you with their story. So if you can share a little bit about your process with that. Well, part of the process, let's, let's start with the equipment. Um, she's got um, the, the light on, on her camera and uh, the lights on on this camera too. I mean, they're shooting in, in sort of um, a controlled environment and we're volunteers here. But um, 
first thing you got to do when you get a camera is you either electronically shut off or tape over your, your light there. Uh, because that intimidates people and you don't want them to know when you're recording, when you're not recording. You want it to be sort of a very personal relationship. Um, you're, you're invading somebody's space when you're making friends with them and every time you film them. Uh, and um, it's a social transaction that has to be a pleasant transaction for, for, for your subject. Um, can't have nose hairs. Um, <laughs> You um, don't wear sunglasses. Um, when we went to Cuba the first time, the guy that we were working with thought he was really cool and wore sunglasses all the time and a hat pulled over here and was more intimidating than he was friendly. So people have to want to share their lives with you. Um, and you have to really believe that, that Peter's a good guy and that um, he has to feel that from you and that, that you're genuinely interested in him and you're not just stealing his soul. You're not going to just film him and then run away and never see him again. Um, he needs to have your phone number uh, to be able to reach you. Uh, we're making a film about um, uh, little kids who come up by themselves from Central America. They all have Claire's phone number. Uh, and feel that they can call her anytime and call her anytime and that if they have a problem we're going to help them as a human being besides being a filmmaker and so all those things are part of what happens. Um, small crews, um, because you're invading somebody's space you don't want to come in with ten people, never use a boom because if you're trying to get somebody to act natural and you got this thing dangling down in front of them um, it, 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 it can be intimidating. Um, eye contact when you're talking to somebody. It's hard to do with these new cameras because you have to be riding the focus so much. Uh, I, it's been a very difficult year for me uh, dealing with these big chip cameras because the way in which I interact with the subject has changed a lot uh, because before I could shoot with the, the EX3 uh, and hold it and know that I'd be in focus. Um, and the camera that he has, I can hold it. I know that I'm going to be in focus. With the cameras that we're using now, you have to keep your nose in the monitor and be riding it the whole time and so you're distracted and your subject can feel it. Um, so I've really been struggling this year to sort of maintain the type of natural relationship. Um, when you're making friends with somebody, you don't start filming them. Um, you're talking to them. You describe what the project is. You, they have to have a stake in this themselves. There's got to be some reason that's a positive reason for them to participate in the project. You have to figure out what that is and to sort of move them forward with that um, as an incentive to them. So there's a, a, a never-ending calculus of decisions that you're making um, that try to maintain that access, keep that access. Um, uh, when, when we were in Baghdad for Baghdad ER, we were supposed to film in this hospital for two days. This was when Bush was uh, prohibiting all images of dead soldiers, wounded soldiers, coffins. You couldn't go to Section 60 in Arlington to film the funerals. He just did a fantastic job of removing the reality from the media. And we were fighting to get that back and so that the American people could see what was happening. It has to be a speech when, when we were like getting the bums rush to leave the hospital and we knew that we had to stay in this hospital and if we could stay in this hospital we'd be able to to basically be at the funnel where all the death and destruction of the war was being taken and brought to us every 50 minutes on these helicopters. At 5 o'clock in the morning when the colonel who ran the hospital came into the hospital we were sitting on the doorstep. And I'm sure you've done this uh, many, many different times and um, we asked him if he thought that the people in the United States understood the sacrifice that they were making working in that hospital, the important work that they were doing and how difficult it was. He says, no, nobody has any idea. Then you have to let us stay here and you have to trust us to tell the story. We need to be able to stay here for two more months to tell the story properly. We can't do it if we have to leave tomorrow. So. Um, Part of what you always need to do is you need to come up with a, a strategy for maintaining your access. Uh, sometimes if it's in a competitive environment, the other report, I can tell you like these incredible Andrea Mitchell stories um, and how she tried to uh, like bump us off, uh, knock us off, steal our footage and things like that and uh, you know how we fought to maintain the access that we have and the advantages that we had. 
So sometimes it's a friendly fight, and you're working with people that you like, and it's easy, and sometimes it's hard, but you have to work on it. Mm -hmm. So as, a, as a, a new emerging filmmaker, let's say you have great characters, unique access, mm -hmm. incredible risk. You have a marvelous story, but if you, you can't get in the door with Sheila Nevins, so the mantra in our business is that if you're in that position as a newbie, you marry up. You find a senior level producer with access and you take to get started on your career. Do you, do, do you take pitches from other filmmakers and partner with them or bring them into the fold for the right story? So what we're doing now, and we're getting better at it, and we're going to do more of it as we continue to uh, build out DCTV, is that um, we're um, sort of adopting five or six projects a year. Okay. Um, there was a documentary uh, about uh, de Klerk, the former president of South Africa, that was edited at DCTV, and we advised the director and helped him move that project. Um, there's a Bitcoin documentary that's being made at DCTV. I don't understand the first thing about Bitcoin. If anybody understands it, you're welcome to explain it to me. Um, but they're making a documentary. There are two other documentaries that are going on. So um, it, we have editing rooms. We have editors that we can team you up with. Uh, we sort of know where some of the booby traps are out there in the field, and we'll try to guide you through those. Um, and we're hoping to start a capital campaign at DCTV. DCTV, um, if you've been there, has editing rooms. We have screening facilities. We have classes. Uh, I know I've seen some of you at our classes. Um, so we're doing whatever we can to help you in our own way. And um, if we succeed in some of the things that we're trying to do this year, we'll be able to do a better job. We're trying to sell our air. Um, everybody knows that in New York City you can sell air, and you can't do this in other cities. But DCTV has a big footprint, mm -hmm. but it's not a very tall building. Um, and so we're working with the city to try to sell our air so that we can have uh, uh, pre-K um, right. facilities uh, that we desperately need in our neighborhood and affordable housing and then money left over to be able to fix up DCTV and, and um, we're holding our breath but we'll see. So John, um, that's a fantastic um, way to end the, uh, the session and um, if I have a great idea with great characters, unique access, and so on, you'd be the one I'd want to marry up with, I can say that. Come, come on over. Um, uh, who, uh, who, anybody going to pay attention to the hockey game tonight? We all rooting for the Islanders over, uh, yeah. the, the, over Washington? This, yeah. is, this is a big deal. So just a little self-promotion to end to. I have a newsletter that's free called documentarytelevision.com, and I have tons of case studies in there wow. of projects that were developed either one-offs, co-productions. I have a feature now on Marlon Wayans' involvement in a celebrity documentary. So check it out. It's free, documentarytelevision.com. And can they get a hold of you if they want you to like write about their really cool project um, that they're doing? Or, or Depends no. how cool the project That's is. That's what I'm saying, right? <laughs> but, but would this be an opportunity for them to like have uh, people know if you decide that it is really a cool project? Yeah, I like helping young people to move ahead. Still a, very much a teacher at heart. Uh-huh. So, I mean, this is the thing. By yourself, you're not going to get very far. You do have to have something to show. Um, get yourself a camera so you're not dependent. Even though we rent cameras, um, you're not going to be able to be with your subject all the times that you need to be with the subject if you have to rent cameras. So you're going to have to buy your own camera. You need that first before you have an editing system. You need to get everything in the can like she has her 300 hours in the can. That's a good problem to have, is to have all your material and to wonder how you're going to edit it. It's better than to have part of the material and to wonder how you're going to edit it. Um, if you can Tom Sawyer, somebody who knows how to edit to work with you, <laughs> that's pretty good. Uh, and you could figure out um, what what you have to offer, or maybe you find somebody who is really, really talented but doesn't have a track record and wants to establish themselves as an editor, you team up with them. Um, and then you start, um, your film is your calling card. You can talk about the film all you want and about how great it is and how good your idea is, but it's put up or shut up. And um, your film will open the doors for you. So on that note, John, um, fantastic presentation, Thank wonderful uh, career, and we're so 
appreciative that you're able to share it with us tonight. And we'll be around to have a chat for the next few minutes for sure. Thank you. And then we'll go to the hockey, right? That's it. Thanks a lot. Right. Thank, Thank you. you.